Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming to the museum tonight for our conversation series. And tonight, I'm thrilled to be speaking to Sarah Krajewski. And before I introduce Sarah, I wanted to mention there is so much happening at the museum. So we just closed our very large scale Leica exhibition. And many of you who may have seen that, we had almost 300,000 people come to the museum, including, <coughs> isn't that fantastic? <coughs> is this working Sorry. okay? Is, everyone, is it going in and out or is it working? It's all working, okay. And then we had almost 65,000 school children, which is really important and, and wonderfully gratifying for this museum. So a great project, but at the same time, many other things happening at once. And I wanted to highlight them, you know, because the curatorial department is so active here and sometimes things get lost. And I wanted to highlight, you know, Julia Dolan, our curator of photography, just has an exhibition up in the photography space on Minor White's early photographs. Please don't miss it. There's a very beautiful, intimate installation of David Smith's work uh, right outside this uh, auditorium to the left. Please don't miss that. Uh, the Center for Contemporary Native Art has interwoven radiance, and that is a, an important show on Klingit tribe Chilkat robes uh, upstairs in the Northwest galleries. Apex, Grace Cook Anderson has our Apex series of Northwest art, and she's featuring Hannah Piper Burns, in, in, sort of a video piece looking at um, a number of things happening today in contemporary society. The video gallery that Sarah curates has Sume Say, Le Echo. It's a very beautiful uh, orchestral musical piece on the third floor of the Jubit mm -hmm. Center. Yep. Robert Flick, Arena is a new installation in the Gilkey Center uh, of phot photographs that sort of complements the automobile show that's about to open. We construct marvels between monuments, and we'll talk about that is on the fourth floor of the Jubit Center. Sarah and I will talk about that. That's happening now. And then picturing Oregon continues to this day. And this is all in anticipation. That's happening. And then we open the uh, Shape of Speed next week, which will be really exciting. I know you've walked by many of the cars on your way in. There's also motorcycles. Uh, one of them you haven't seen, and one is still in a crate. And we keep telling people as they walk by they're not allowed to look because the show's not open. <laughs> so don't look. And then also Sarah is curating on the second floor an exhibition of the early works of uh, Diebenkorn. And Diebenkorn, as you may or may not know, was born in Portland, although he moved <coughs> when he was two years old. So I don't know if we can claim it as ours. But Diebenkorn went and became uh, very significant for his own Ocean Park series, which many of you know. But this is an exhibition that looks at his early work and how he came to the Ocean Park series, how he explored landscape, how he explored the figure, and then pulled it all together. And it should be a fascinating show. We're collaborating with the, um, the Diebenkorn Foundation. So all of those are happening and um, a number of other things. And then my next uh, conversation is with Grace, who is our curator of Northwest Art, and I believe that's August 16th. I think that's coming up, so um, stay tuned for that. But tonight we're here, and I'm so pleased to meet and uh, have you meet in, in more detail Sarah Krajewski, and let me just give you a brief bio of Sarah. She was appointed curator of modern and contemporary art in June of 2015, so she's been here about three years. Prior to that, she was the director of INOVA, which is the Institute of Visual Arts at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. She curated a number of interdisciplinary, and interdisciplinary exhibitions and performance with artists such as Xavier Cha, Matteo Tanat, and Morgan Thor Thorson, who you may know because we did a show with her. Uh, Sarah was also for a number of years at the Henry Art Gallery at the University of Washington, and that was between 2004 and 2012. And she focused on solo projects such as Matthew Buckingham, Andrew D Dadson, Jeffrey Mitchell, who's in our collection, Walid Rod, among others, and group exhibitions exploring photography's impact on visual culture. Um, Sarah is the recipient of a very prestigious curatorial fellowship from the Andy Warhol Foundation a number of years ago for visual arts for research into emerging inter interdisciplinary 
artistic practices. She's held curatorial positions besides Innova and at the Henry at the um, Museum or Madison Museum of Contemporary Art in Madison, Wisconsin, and the Harvard Art Museums. And she has a BA in art history from the University of Wisconsin Madison, as well as an MA in art history uh, from Williams College. And then you're probably wondering why are we looking <laughs> at Richard Long at the Milwaukee Art Museum? Well, we start the conversation tonight because at this time, I did this installation with my colleagues at the Milwaukee Art Museum. We just opened up this very beautiful wing by Santiago Calatrava. Has anyone been there? Be yeah, beautiful space. And I did this installation, but I was doing this installation as head of the curatorial department, but also without a curator of contemporary art. So Sarah and I met because I was doing interviews, so we met 22 years ago. My God. <laughs> I think maybe, <laughs> no, 22, really? maybe 22, wow. 20 years ago? Wow. Yeah, maybe 18. That's a long time ago. Yeah. 1999, 1999-2000. <laughs> uh, and, and, I, and I want to put this picture up there because I just thought it was a beautiful installation. But it's also a point of, of starting because Sarah and I go way back. And um, I met, again, I met Sarah. She was a curator at Madison. And I knew right away there was something very special there. And I knew someday I was going to work with her. Although not in Milwaukee, it turned out that we hired her here. We were able to work together here in, in, in uh, Portland. So it's very gratifying for me to talk about and to have a conversation with Sarah, knowing our shared background or when we met each other. And the art world is very small, and we all stay in touch. I'll also say, um, when, when we were looking for, to fill this position after Bruce retired, we, uh, we, we did an, a national search, international search. Many, many people applied. But it was the director of the Henry, who I've known for years, who just said to me, Brian, you know, Sarah has just done a remarkable job up at the Henry, and you really need to consider her. As well as a local collector who was very fond and Sarah has worked with before, who really recommended Sarah. So it's a real pleasure for us to have Sarah bring her expertise, bring her commitment to inter interdisciplinary contemporary art. But also, as you notice, Sarah has a remarkable ability with uh, looking at the entire 20th century, and she's done really exciting projects. So tonight, we're going to walk through a little bit of her career, how it's been shaped, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the future. So let's start uh, with this image, and um, I'm excited that she put this in the slides, because this is uh, Rebecca Horn, and talk about why we have Rebecca Horn up here, Sarah. Sure. Well, um, you know, these occasions always um, are an opportunity to look back and reflect on um, my career, of course, you asked me to pull together some images, and you asked me who I wrote my thesis on. And I have an uh, MA, not a PhD, so I wrote a thesis, and it was on Rebecca Horn, the German artist. Uh, she, uh, per I was looking particularly at her performance works, and she's become much better known for these kinetic sculptures that came out of these kinds of body extensions that she was doing um, as, a, as a much younger artist. Uh, here's a couple of images of those kinetic sculptures. She uses a lot of organic material, and if you can make this out, it, they're really lovely, soft feathers. Uh, but uh, as I was thinking back to that moment, and now seeing how far I've come in working with artists with uh, a varied practice, with interdisciplinary work that touches on performance and the body and sculpture and installation, I was you know, just kind of mildly surprised that right there as a, as a young uh, graduate student, I was already deeply into that, um, attracted to that work. I was so excited as we were preparing, and I, I remember Sarah talked about Rebecca Horn, but um, revisiting that was so significant. And some of you, if you've traveled in Europe, she's extremely popular in, in Europe, and in particular, Italy. Some of you have been to Italy with us on some museum trips, and we saw a number of Rebecca Horn pieces similar to what you see here. But again, if you're over in Europe, going to some of the art fairs, going to the more contemporary spaces, you'll see a lot of Rebecca Horn pieces. And, and as Sarah mentioned, they move also. They can be kinetic in their, in their form. They're very lyrical and very beautiful. So having that background is really um, informative, I think, to your, to your work and to mm -hmm. your vision. Yeah. And then your years at the Henry, a number of years you spent there. And the Henry is such a significant player in the Northwest and in, in University Art Museum galleries. Talk a little bit about your experience there and what you were trying to accomplish. Sure. Well, it was really, I think, at the Henry that I um, became really committed to an artist-centered curatorial practice. So by that, I mean 
really working closely with artists on solo exhibitions or helping them to uh, create or realize uh, artworks. And uh, the Henry has had a long reputation in facilitating that kind of uh, exhibition and engagement. Um, I grabbed this picture because when I started at the Henry, I had a dual position. I was in the curatorial and the education departments. So I got, I got my feet wet in the kind of programmatic side um, by organizing uh, talks and, and programs. And the Henry is part of the University of Washington. So we engaged a lot with faculty um, who um, came in and, and spoke about works or curated small shows. And so that, um, that level of um, uh, dialogue and, and discourse around contemporary art uh, and the objects and the artists was uh, also really an and, important and very part informative of my development. too, I think, to what we're doing here. And, and, mm -hmm. and you've really taken us further, and I'm so pleased. I know some of the educators are here. I think Stephanie Parrish from the Education Department's here tonight. But this idea of collaboration and deep, deep uh, partnerships within the organization, across the organization, and within the community is so important. And I think you've done a wonderful job with the team here. And, and many of the projects that you've seen now happening are the result of that collaboration. I think, again, starting with your vision here. Yeah, um, I brought out this um, image of Walid Rod's uh, project. This is a later version of an exhibition that we did at the Henry. And uh, just to give you an example of the kind of work and the artists that I was drawn to working with at the Henry. Um, well, this project of Walid's was based on his growing up in uh, war-torn uh, Beirut, Lebanon, uh, as a young person taking photographs and, and experiencing that disruption in his growing up. Uh, and at the, at the Henry, we always seem to find artists at pivotal moments. So you see this slide is from an exhibition that Walid had at MoMA 10 years after our exhibition at the Henry. So it was a place where we um, tried to identify artists that we could work with and nurture their practice and um, give them a platform to experiment with, uh, with, their, um, with, their, with their work. Uh, also, I did quite a, work quite a bit with uh, emerging artists at the Henry, so young artists, uh, uh, often giving them their first museum uh, solo exhibition. Uh, we inaugurated a series of awards called The Brink uh, during my time at the Henry, and uh, this is just an example of one of the artists that won that award, uh, uh, Andrew Dadson from Vancouver, BC. Um, the Brink was an opportunity to Again, kind of hitting on those same theme, themes of, of, of uh, nurturing artists, giving them a, a professional development experience. It was a. It also comes with a um, an award, a cash mm -hmm. award, which artists always need more money and funds to do what they do. Uh, so it was really uh, a privilege to be a part of that program. So Sarah, how did and and I don't want to. You and I didn't talk about this question, but mm -hmm. how did the Henry navigate regionalism and globalism? I mean, what was the perspective and what did you think about that yeah. when you were curating there? That's actually a great question because we didn't, we didn't purposefully um, uh, categorize artists as Northwest or mm -hmm. you know, from, a, from an international, we just worked with artists. And so um, what we were trying, what, the Brink, however, was a regional art competition. Uh, and through the process of thinking about what does it mean to curate in a region, what does it mean to be an artist in a region, we wanted to look at where we thought um, uh, dialogues were happening, and that was along the I-5 corridor. So the Brink represents a kind of ca a look at Cascadia uh, yes. from Vancouver, BC down to down here to Portland so and into Oregon. Uh, so that was a bit of a step away from what has traditionally been considered the region with the kinds of biennials that, uh, that have taken place. Yeah. And this Josiah McElhaney, and we have a Josiah piece up now um, next to the Yepi Hine and the Anish Kapoor. And this was an ac acquisition you made, or an, a project that you did with the Henry. Yeah, no, this is, uh, this. I wanted to, you'll, 
You'll see where I'm going with this in a couple of slides, but um, at the Henry, we also invited artists to um, investigate the collection and make projects out of their research into uh, our holdings. And um, Josiah was one of the first artists that participated in that project. Uh, he works in glass and in installation, and um, the gist of this project was um, uh, the Henry is not widely known for having a textile and costume collection, and he became really fascinated with a series of dresses that we had that were given by a donor uh, who went to Paris every year to get her wardrobe, right. and, uh, right. and so he weaves a tale around um, Dior's new look. If you advance the slide, there's a... Um, Dior's new look from the 40s and g male glass blowers and um, uh, the owner's wife who scandalously comes to the, the shop floor and the, all the men are so obsessed with her they blow these kinds of shapes of vases. Uh, <laughs> Josiah is a wonderful, he's, he just weaves together so many different histories of objects, of materials, of labor and of modernism in particular. But this was a pretty straightforward, many um, museums at this time were asking artists to come in and look at the collections and kind of problematize um, different holdings that museums would have. And Fred Wilson um, was the first to really uh, do, that, do that work with his uh, groundbreaking project called Mining the Museum. That's right. So this was kind of on the tail end of that trend, but we continued to work with artists to like, look at our collection and analyze and you know, just bring a different perspective to it until we got to um, the next slide is a project I uh, worked on with. Um, and, and before we go on, oh, sorry. I, I wanted Sarah to put this slide up because we need a Josiah McElhaney in the collection. So I'm sort, of, <laughs> I'm sort of pitching this as an artist that I've always loved. We recently met Josiah. I find his work beautiful and intellectually extremely rigorous. Um, MacArthur Genius Award winner. So um, yeah, this is something if we come to the board or the community, we need a Josiah, I'm telling you now. Okay, so this is a, a fascinating project. Again, bringing artists in to look at the collection. Yeah, so um, Sutton Barris Color trio of artists who work in Seattle, and when we invited them to come and look at the collection, like one of the first things that we always would do is bring uh, artists into storage. And actually anybody who goes into the museum storage just loves to see the racks of paintings. Yeah. Things are, are typically for Western art, it's arranged by size, and it's not much designation for chronology or, or materials, mediums. Uh, sculptures are on shelves. So there's this sense of, of storage, of just data really being kind of held uh, before it's put into the galleries in a more formal setting. And they wanted to bring that experience out into the gallery for visitors to um, just see things or not see things. Really, it was very. This is a double height space at the Henry, so it's a fish-eyed lens. Uh, so they created this viewing mechanism that um, you could control remotely uh, in another gallery and get close-up views of all of the works. Uh, so you couldn't really see the entirety. It was like a kind of macro and micro project. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring this slide out for discussion is just that I, this project was impactful for me because of the way it really just kind of blew up the kind of traditional model and looked at things in a very unconventional way. And the use of technology and the use of um, uh, a, a new way of seeing was really fascinating for and me. And at the same time, going back to a salon hanging, which is much more historic. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. was it successful? Was it a good project? Were you pleased with this one? I was pleased with it, and the artists really were happy with the, the, the Henry really, the staff really had to stretch, and that was also a really exciting prospect too, was for the um, curator of collections and registrars and others to think, you know, kind of creatively with the collection. Unfortunately, um, the, the piece was called Panoptos, and that was the name of the little robot. He yeah. always broke down. Broke so, down. <laughs> so it's Beware sort of one of these projects that lives on in, in memory, in a rosier uh, state than, um, than it actually existed in. Uh, but I think some of that spirit of just experimentation again and um, thinking unconventionally about collections is something I've carried forward. Yeah. And, and I think 
And is this Innova here? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think what's so important about the Henry, and we're going to talk a little bit about Innova, this is the moment where art institutions can really have a huge impact on um, education, college students, where they find their voice, they're looking for the world, learning, and I think the impact and the importance is so significant. And Innova uh, is such a major um, niche organization, Kunstall at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Talk about what you did there, and, and Sarah became the director. Yeah, so the Henry was a medium-sized museum, and then going from the Henry in a university setting to Innova, another university, I, it, my, this institution was two people, myself and our uh, operations preparator. Uh, so as the director and curator, I really was in, engaged in all levels of the day-to-day um, uh, -day operations and the creative side of it. Um, I have these, this selection of images to suggest the kind of variety of experience there. I was working with students, uh, working um, with faculty members, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also with alums. Uh, this is an image from Michelle Grabner exhibition that we did. She was, earned an art history degree at UWM, and she's gone on to have a career as, a, as a, an artist, curator, and critic. Um, uh, she's already quite well known by the time we did this show, but, um, uh, and Innova was, is, is, was very focused on exhibition projects, and again, helping artists to create new work and to debut it um, in the gallery spaces. So an, another very artist-centered organization. Yeah, and, and it's a global reach. And this is the first, when I lived in Milwaukee, it was the first place I uh, saw the Cree Master series by Matthew Barney. And you know it was very progressive and very thoughtful and really thought in global terms. And it's a great place. And for those of you um, in, the, in our community, you may remember Michelle was the guest curator at one of the recent Dischecta projects. I think it was two years ago. When yeah, was the, the Oregon, Oregon Biennial. Biennial. And a very, very skilled artist. Also has done guest curation at the Whitney. I think she was at the Biennale, uh, the Whitney Biennale. Yeah, the Whitney Biennial, Biennial excuse uh, me, yeah. uh, two times Two ago. times, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this is another project at Innova. Yeah, so um, one of the... Um, guiding, um, guiding lines for me at Innova was to consider art as a, uh, a research practice. And a lot of the faculty were very invested in this notion of art having this kind of discursive mode that it could be a way of researching and uh, reporting back on our experiences uh, in our, our contemporary worlds. Um, this exhibition, Placing the Golden Spike, Landscapes of the Anthropocene, was developed out of a relationship with a postdoctoral uh, post student in philosophy and looking at uh, the impact of human existence on geology and geography and thinking that through by, with, by and with artists. So we had um, in the image you see on the right, uh, a couple of examples there was, we, we considered plastics, um, oil, um, the first nuclear, uh, first atomic bomb explosion, uh, and, um, and other physical impacts that were made uh, upon, um, uh, upon the earth. And then if you go to the next slide, we also looked at the kinds of landscapes we had begun to inhabit. So um, this work by Xavier Chaw called Surveil, I'm sorry, it's a very dark image, um, utilized um, uh, tracking software on computers to track uh, volunteer users' pathways through the internet, and then taking those data points and creating a choreographic language out of those um, uh, clicks. And um, it was pretty remarkable. I, I was one of the volunteers, and the, you go to the same places. You inhabit a certain landscape in your digital life. And then um, the, these were two student um, dancers. Um, Innova was part of the Peck School of the Arts, which in, included right. dance, film, visual art, uh, theater, and music. So I had a really rich array of colleagues to work with. Um, and Xavier uh, placed the dance on these two young um, artists who were amazing. Uh, she first did the piece if you go to the next slide, yes. um, in 2014 with two very sophisticated dancers who'd previously worked with Merce Cunningham. Um, 
At this time, that I was deep into my research with the Warhol Curatorial Fellowship, uh, which focused on um, artists and institutions and, then, and navigating around these kinds of transdisciplinary forms that were increasingly coming into visual art spaces. So uh, I, Xavier is not a trained choreographer. She works in, she, I think she, it's probably easiest to say she uses humans and bodies as her medium. So there's a lot of performance involved in it, but there's this very much a kind of intellectual, idea-driven investigation about um, the way that we inhabit our bodies and inhabit these and, digital spaces. And was spaces. the gallery all lit with that dark green? Or that, that The green light is uh, part of the stage, the staging, but the, that's a Mark Lecky um, sculpture behind it, which adds a kind of ominous level to yes. it. That, that exhibition was also about these kinds of um, digital environments. And then Morgan Thorson, you did some work with her at Innova, and then you brought some of her projects here. This is very significant for this museum because one of the other things we were looking for is how do we partner with our community in a deeper way? And Sarah uh, came on board and did that immediately with this project where we partnered with TBA, PICA's um, time-based art festival in the September of, I think this was 15, 16. 16. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, um, Morgan, um, I. Uh, first uh, signed on to work with Morgan while I was at Innova. We were a co-presenter -pres and commissioner of this work called Still Life, which is uses the museum as a specific setting to think about time and think about uh, uh, museums have a very sp specific relationship to time. It's different than human bodies that inhabit um, these spaces. Uh, and when I... Um, arrived here, uh, Morgan was looking for other places to present her work, and she had become an artist at the Creative Exchange Lab that is also part of uh, PICA's programming. So it was really a kind of nice dovetail that um, we were able to kind of collaborate to present this piece during the time yeah, and it really, I, I'm so happy about this work. It sent a strong message to our community that the museum can move into so many different disciplines. And this project in particular was very successful. I think it was up for about a week. Yeah, there were and five days, I think it was five days. Five days, yeah. an mm -hmm. evening, and the, the number of people that came, and then the diversity of age that came was really exciting. I also know my wife brought her high school students to this, and they, they really adored it. It was, it was a great, great project. Um, um, oh, before we leave yes. that, I also just wanted to mention that this is in the gallery that um, the Clement Greenberg collection has typically been hung, and so it was really nice to see a transformation of that space as well. And uh, you know, when I first arrived, I of course wanted to make my mark in the collection galleries and and reinterpret certain hangings, and um, so it was um, nice to be able to transform the space and kind of you know make that break from a previous um, installation. Um, through this really incredible work. And then I think we repainted the walls and yeah, we painted over those up. charcoal drawings yeah. and we yeah. put in a few of those paintings and you'd back. Never so. You'd never know. You'd never know. You'd never know. I hope you do. It looks very different up there now. <laughs> Well, this was quite a project, and I had been speaking uh, with collector Jordan Schnitzer about his collection, and as many of you know, he's one of the largest collectors of prints, post-war prints in the country, and he has a very large collection of Andy Warhol, so I said, Jordan, I'd really like to do Andy Warhol. So we started this in the works before Sarah arrived, and then she started and maybe moved into her house or was renting her house, and I said, oh, by the way, can you pull together a major retrospective of 12,000 square feet of prints for Andy Warhol? And oh, by the way, can you do a publication? And she said, sure. <laughs> no, I don't well, know, Jeff. Maybe the conversation was different at home. But at work, she was, sure, OK. Well, thankfully, all the works were in one place. So that's part of the yeah. challenge is trying to locate everything. And so <clears throat> as you mentioned, Jordan's collection was, is so comprehensive, and it really gave us an opportunity to show from the very earliest print projects from the 1950s all the way up to the final print series. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was, I think everyone thinks they know who Warhol is, or we have a, just a general sense of his work, and so it, 
it really, working on this show helped me to make connections and amongst the artists that I'm interested in and the way that they um, have very broad practices. I, I think there's a parallel to the way that Warhol you know, was a, um, a painter, a printmaker, a publisher, a movie, a filmmaker, it, and he it was, is one of these artists who is just by nature interdisciplinary and, uh, and creates work um, through this kind of production model that uh, I see myself being very interested in. Well, you know, the, what this also reflects is Sarah's ability to go up and down the 20th century and do projects at such a high level. I mean, I can have conversations with Sarah about de Kooning, Picasso, jump to Warhol, and then go right to Morgan Thorson. And you are so skilled and you are so informed about all the movements of the 20th century. I'm forever impressed. And this project, I think, really reflected that. And then this installation as part of Warhol was so important to, uh, I think, that exhibition because there's been many Warhol exhibitions. but. Looking at the Flash portfolio, which you installed so beautifully and looked at and reinterpreted, but also the extent and the questions that you asked around Warhol really did change the conversations around Andy Warhol. This exhibition ended up also traveling to the High Museum um, and also to the uh, Palm Springs Art Museum. I don't know if it's traveled anywhere else, but has really made us think more deeply about Warhol. And talk a little yeah. bit about the Flash series. Uh, this uh, series is um, a, a portfolio. Some uh, scholars and, and critics think of it almost like an as an illustrated book, which Warhol did also make books in his print practice. Um, it's uh, as a portfolio. It's um, images tucked inside of um, uh, the folded portfolio pages. The images are all taken from the media surrounding the assassination of, of JFK, and the text on the, uh, on the pages is teletype from that day as the reports were starting to come in. And typically the, the works are displayed only as image, not with the text. That's right. So it's, it's separated, and you, in those cases you see this uh, very, um, I guess, conventional representation of Warhol as an image appropriator uh, and uh, a manipulator of images of popular culture. But once it's paired with the text uh, and the way that we in installed it and this um, exhibition design, we worked with Ziba Design and early on they kind of identified um, a kind of a dark room within the exhibition space, so it felt natural to put this kind of uh, more somber um, uh, tone into that space. Uh, Rick Axum, who was one of the curators, uh, uh, he is, he's a, a print expert and a curator and wrote uh, an in-depth essay in the catalog about this piece, uh, really goes a little bit further into the reading of why Warhol would have paired these works together um, that is, um, hadn't, you know, there was some speculation in there. We don't know what Warhol was thinking really during that time. He, he kept um, many of his feelings to himself. <laughs> um, but um, uh, that, or that level of thinking and, and original research into the material was, um, I, I found that really inspiring. And it also made me think about, I walked into the exhibition once with a, a good friend of mine and an artist, and in the beginning room, we see uh, images of, of Marilyn, images of um, Jackie at the, at the funeral, and uh, other images that for that individual, he just expressed how much he thought Warhol was heartbroken by America at this stage. Yes. And I didn't really see that in installing the exhibition that way, but yeah, it felt to me like here are all these, you know, Marilyn had, had died, Kennedy had died, and it, it was a really interesting so trauma. vibe from that, that kind yeah. of trauma of the American yeah. experience, yeah. which I think carried through in this Very installation. Powerful. yeah. I hope you all enjoyed that show. It was a great, it was a great, great project. Uh, and then we did Josh Klein, and this was another project on the fourth floor. This is significant because I think when I um, was 
thinking about this with Sarah, my colleague, Adam Weinberg, who's the director of the Whitney Museum, had just purchased a major Josh Klein, and so I knew we were onto something. And then the director of the new museum, Lisa Phillips, said, oh my goodness, you're doing a project with Josh Klein? He's one of the most important artists working today in New York. <laughs> and so here we are out in Portland, Oregon, doing this project, and you did it. I mean, you did it, and it's a, it was very powerful. Yeah. Uh, this. Uh for me, coming in and having the Miller Meigs Endowment for Contemporary Art Projects, um, this exhibition also represented a kind of reboot of that series and around the thinking behind it. Um, in the past, it had been used to fund uh, three or four exhibitions a year, and I wanted to devote all the funding from that endowment to one significant project. Uh, and and bring some of my artist-centered practice into, uh, curatorial practice into it. So with uh, Josh's project, um, the, some of the work was um, existing already, had been shown at the new museum, but in the next slide, um, you know, he was able to utilize the funding from our exhibition um, to produce the final works in what he called a chapter, uh, the chapter called Freedom. Uh, he's, a, he's one of these artists who works almost like a filmmaker, kind of working through various projects, and uh, so this episode, um, was a, we were able to complete it through that. And it, it was, I, you know, for those of you who remember this exhibition, there were donuts, and the audience couldn't decide whether they were supposed to take the donuts or not. I remember right, getting daily yeah. reports, mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm. uh, and actually, they weren't supposed to take the donuts. Yeah, but, some uh, had crushed glass and razor blades, yeah. and so. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's. It, I'm really grateful to have the Miller Miggs Endowment because it allows me to do shows that are that may be more difficult and challenging and touch on relevant topics and that may not, um, uh, you know, honestly be something that we could fundraise for. It allows me to have right. a little bit le a greater level of freedom and experimentation around the works that can be a part of that show. And, and I think this was very powerful for us because it really changed. Um, maybe the perception of our, um, what we show, the mediums that we show in the Miller, or in the Jubit Center. We have an incredible painting collection. We have great sculptures. We do some video, but this idea of installation, video, uh, sculpture that is, again, much more um, cutting edge was really, I think, a, a strong statement of us expanding our curatorial dialogue. So yeah. thank you for that. And, uh, and then, um, Nicholas is piece Gallatin, and, and this is important for a number of reasons, and this was acquired by the museum, and well, why don't you talk about why it's significant? Sure, well, um, because the third floor uh, of the Jubit Center had been transformed for the Richard Moss exhibition, uh, one of those spaces wa was transformed into a, a black box video space or a, a dark video gallery. So I've continued to use that space to present video works, uh, and Nicholas's piece was one of the first in that um, ongoing series. Um, this was a work that I collaborated with Dina Dard, our former curator of Native American art, to purchase for the museum. And that collaborative spirit is something that we continue to develop in the uh, curatorial team. Uh, so breaking down these silos between collecting areas um, where we could have this work be a part of the Native American art collection as well as the contemporary art collection. Yeah. And this idea of the native cultures, a living culture, living artists, contemporary Native American art was was really prominent and continues with this piece, and we're very grateful for that. Um, and then also we did another video installation, and I just want to pause. It has been suggested, I think it's a great suggestion, that we endow our video gallery, so we always have videos. So if you're interested in helping us endow that, <laughs> let us know. Um, because we've done really important projects since the Richard Moss, and mm -hmm. it allowed us to do the space, inclu including the Sanford Biggers installation, which included a sculpture that Bruce had acquired along with a video piece. Yeah, these were works acquired by the Contemporary Art Council. Uh, so um, the Contemporary Kudos to them. Yeah, Thank the you. Contemporary Art Council has been very active in helping us acquire wonderful works that have really uh, made an impact on our contemporary art spaces. Um, this is um, a the two works by Sanford Biggers were also part of an exhibition that Bruce had done about on the artist's work as part of the Miller Miggs series. 
Uh, but video is an area of the collection I think we can expand greatly. We have very few video holdings, so um, I've shown two of our small number of videos in the space and alternated it with other uh, videos that I've borrowed. Um, a Steve McQueen video, the Sue Made Say yeah. video is also a loan. So, um, so I'm looking to expand that part of the collection as well. It's really important, I think, to do that. Uh, this was really exciting for us. We transformed the fourth floor of the Jubit Center, and I remember walking up there, and this is Jenny Holzer's benches, and it was Gober, Jenny Holzer, and Jeff Koons that Sarah pulled together, again, looking back in some of the great um, masters of the late 20th century and, and today, and created something really beautiful. Talk about what you were trying to do with this, and then where did you, where did you get the loans? Sure. Well, don't forget the Bruce Nauman, which was Bruce like Nauman. everybody's oh, that's right. least favorite piece I think I've brought <laughs> here. That's the No No New Museum, which I'm, I maybe you've blocked it out of your memory. The clown you heard who was it, yelling, like, jumping up and down, that, yelling yeah. No 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 No. That was part of this um, installation too. Uh, we had the opportunity to bring in um, three significant works of art. Uh, that were purchased through uh, what's now called Art Bridges Foundation, which is an initiative of Alice Walton and Crystal Bridges. Um, she had, um, the oh, oh, they look much better up there than yeah. they do on our little screen. Yeah. Um, the um, Jeff Koons basketball, uh, a beautiful Robert Gober butter sculpture, uh, and the Bruce Nauman video. And so it just presented an opportunity to expand on those artists with uh, loans. Um, the Jenny Holzer you see in the, the background, the framed posters are in our collection. Uh, but to look at this moment in the uh, 80s and 90s and the development of these pretty these very significant artists so I complemented the um, uh, the loans from the Art Bridges Foundation with uh, local loans uh, from um, from a handful of collectors and I, and I just have to compliment you I thought the installation was really beautifully done juxtaposed and how things were placed and I think the Jenny Holzer image that I just showed really uh, demonstrated that great skill that you have in installation this was a, an acquisition recently mm -hmm. made. Yeah, this so after the um, uh, Jenny Holzer, uh, Jeff Koons, Gober, and Nauman, um, we used the fourth floor to highlight recent acquisitions, which was a really uh, nice opportunity for me to um, look at the last couple of years of acquiring a few pieces uh, and the. Uh, some acquisitions that my colleagues had made uh, and thinking about contemporary art again as this kind of cross, um, at least for the museum, as a kind of cross-departmental collaboration. So in addition to this um, work by Amalia Pika, um, we also installed works by, the next slides, um, Arnold Kemp that yes. we were able to purchase. He's now in Chicago, but has a uh, long time Portland connections. Um, and uh, the next slide is uh, the wonderful Wendy Red Star photographs of the seasons, uh, which um, uh, the, this exhibit, this rotation or small exhibition on the fourth floor um, allowed us to, to kind of look at a diversity of artists and diversity of practices. And then We Construct Marvels, which is happening now. And, and again, this was a conversation Sarah Miggs and I had about how do we really integrate the museum deeper into the artistic creative community of Portland and Oregon and the region. And this was this is an, a year-long project that Sarah collaborated with Education and Stephanie Parrish and Grace in, in the Northwest collection area to create something quite special. Yeah, and our um, guest artistic director, Libby Warble, has been a driving force behind um, the five exhibitions and the set of programs that go along with it. But um, this is again on the fourth floor of the Jubit Center, so a continuation of activating these spaces uh, with work that is uh, a little more experimental or risk-taking. Um, right now we're in Marvels, which is the third exhibition of that series, and Marvels activates a work of art that's in our collection by the artist Stephanie Sajuko, and it's called Not MoMA. Uh, it's the first work of social practice 
art that we've collected uh, through uh, the efforts of the PSU's uh, Art and Social Practice Program. Uh, and um, also Stephanie Parrish had a hand in uh, and um, developing the relationships and presenting this work. Um, not MoMA is a conceptual art piece, so what we collected were the instructions for how to make this work. And so Marvels reactivates the, the conceptual artwork uh, using, uh, or how should I say, using sounds kind of not right, inspired, not the right. Inspired, inspired by it. By, or? <laughs> we asked uh, several high school students at three, um, three oh. local high schools that, to help us activate the, the project by um, the gist of it is recreating works from MoMA's collection only using the digital online collection tools and the entire project uh, explores issues of authenticity, uh, who has access to museum collections, and how do we learn about original works of art yeah. today, which is often in that And this is a, space. a high school reproduction of a Mark Bradford piece. Mark Bradford recently represented the United States at the Biennale two years ago, and uh, it's really fun. Go up there, make sure you see it. W what's very gratifying for me with this project is, as director, is when you go up there, the diversity of individuals going on a daily basis, but also for programs, um, it's been really exciting to activate that space. It's very, very gratifying. It sometimes, you there's no space to even stand. There's so many individuals from parts of this city that is really, really gratifying for this museum. Yeah, well, I really have to hand it to Libby as a uh, as our collab collaborator and instigator in this. She has um, really uh, drawn together an ambitious array of, of uh, participants to um, exhibit their work, to help curate exhibitions, and um, all around the notion of asking the museum questions, just asking questions. Why do we do what we do? Who is coming? How can we expand our uh, audiences? Uh, how can we make artists see the museum? How can we help artists see the museum as a resource, uh, some place that is for them, and how artists can also help us uh, examine our own practices? Okay, now, <laughs> I don't know if you'll see this. <laughs> this is a great story, and it's a story where this painting resided in our vault for a number of years. I forget the acquisition is 1997. 1997. Mm -hmm. So almost 20 years, this painting by Mary Corse resided in our um, vault, and then uh, Sarah brought it out, put it up on the wall, and it was on the th second floor, I believe, of the Jubit Center. And it was up for several months. It's she's an incredibly important uh, artist working today. And as soon as it went up, we got a letter from the Whitney. There's a major retrospective of Mary Course opening up. I think next week, Dia Beacon has a major installation of her work. So we had a loan letter from the director of Dia Beacon as well as the Whitney competing for who was going to borrow this piece. Well, it turns out. This piece is now, that's a picture of Mary, is at Dia Beacon in an installation. And if you've read some of the local press, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, doing major articles on Mary Corse, she's being rediscovered. I love this story because it sat in our vaults. We brought in a Sarah and she said, that's something important, let's put it up. And it's obvious it is important. What did you see? What were you, how did this come about? Sure, well, one of the, one of my, um, desires is to um, highlight more of the women artists who are in our collection. Mm -hmm. And so when I came across this in the database, I thought, well, this is a really significant figure in uh, West Coast art. She's based in Los Angeles, uh, part of kind of loosely associated with the uh, California light and space uh, movement, artists like um, Terrell, James Terrell, um, uh, Robert Irwin, you know, all these, these major figures. And, um, and I just thought, I'm like, wow, how did this get here? <laughs> this right. is wonderful. Right. And so um, it, it was on view once in an exhibition of recent acquisitions shortly after it was acquired from a, the bequest of Marsha Wiseman, who is a significant Los Angeles area collector. And uh, so, um, we put it up on view, and I was at a, at a conference and talking to a colleague, the, the chief curator at DIA, and we, she had just 
hasn't been with the organization long, so we were just trading stories about things that you find when you're looking at your collection and getting to know it. And I mentioned this painting, and she said, well, we just acquired a handful of, of Mary's work, and we're thinking of putting it on view. So I thought, well, that's amazing. And uh, so when I, I, I come back to Portland and um, she gets in touch with me a couple of months later that they, they are proceeding with their plans and we actually have a couple images of the, um, you know, there's, that's coming up. So then. Yeah. So if you're in New York, go to see Mary Course. Yeah, Our opening painting tomorrow. won't be there, but this uh, is a, that Dia. Uh, and here's our painting, the left or the right image is um, the, our, the museum's painting installed at DIA. You can see it a little bit better in this picture, and there's other um, works in the show, but you get a sense from the image on your left, uh, the natural light that is flooding the space. Uh, if you've been to DIA Beacon, you know that it's just a, a fantastic and facility. And she puts in, um, it's pieces of auto paint or fiberglass in the texture, so yeah. when you see it closely, you get that light and that, that glow. Yeah, they're small glass Glass. There, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of reflective material that you would see in uh, road signs that when the light hits it it. It, it, it illuminates. So as you can imagine with that natural light flooding in the, in the gallery. We also were able to do some conservation on this piece, which was really uh, an exciting pr process in working with the artist and um, our, our conservator, Samantha Springer, did a fantastic job. Actually, I got to meet Mary um, at DIA when it opened and she said, where did you have to fix this piece? So that was a huge compliment to Samantha yeah, for, for doing such a wonderful, um, wonderful job. And if you do go to DIA Beacon, if you're able to get there, ours is the best painting because one of our trustees went and said ours is the best one in the whole installation. It really so is. It's, it's a fact. It's, it, it was before she did all of the others, this was the one that it clicked. And it's, it's very different, and you'll see it if you go to see the show at just how important it is. Yeah. Um, this is another work. You may walk by this one continually. This is Dorothy Rockburn. I, I asked her to point out a few that um, historically, this museum has done a, a really fine job of finding some important contemporary artists, uh, especially women artists, and this is one of them. Yeah, at, concurrently with the show, with Mary Corse's exhibition at DIA is a really beautiful installation of Dorotea's work. And I'm just convinced like she is the next uh, woman artist over 80 years old that's gonna get finally get her due because uh, this, uh, the, the work is, um, it, it doesn't quite fit into the narratives. In fact, I was uh, just reading a little bit about this particular series of hers, and she called it, she felt that she was out of step. Mm. So it's a little bit, it's later than the minimalists. It's, you know, in the late 70s and early 80s, you're starting to see more neo-expressionist painting. And she's really exploring painting in this very personal and very idiosyncratic way where she's folding canvases and using pencil to draw and make connections between them. And um, the work just feels so relevant and fresh right now. This is one of the works where I know outside critics will come to our museum and they'll point this one out like, oh my goodness, you have this piece and it's quite significant. Yeah. And this is really important, I think, for our community and I think for this institution, this Jacob Lawrence piece. And if you notice, you can see that it was acquired in 43. Is that right? Yes, yep. 1943, mm -hmm. it was the ninth object, uh, as, as fifth part of that portfolio. And we wanted to highlight this because again, the significance of this museum and the Contemporary Art Council and a number of collectors here contributing to our collection is so significant because this has become an iconic piece of the 20th century. Yeah, I wanted to show this work as an example of, of the museum acquiring a piece, a contemporary piece, the year that it was made and yeah. how important that was in supporting the artist and building the collection. But there's also an interesting connection that uh, the Migration series was shown here at the museum in 1942. Mm. And that's Jacob Lawrence's sig uh, significant body of work tracking the, the, uh, migra the great migration of African Americans from the South into Northern cities in the early decades of the 20th century. And that made such an impact on the museum that the, and Jacob Lawrence was a longtime Seattle uh, resident and, uh, and uh, 
I guess you could say regional artist with a national presence, uh, that um, in the object file, there's a wonderful letter describing the impact that was made from this exhibition in 1942, actually 1943, sorry, that the the um, museum went and purchased five do, pieces. Do, do you remember who the curator was or the director? The dir was um, it Dr. Newton, maybe? No, no. no. Okay. Nope. So I'll I don't. I'll have to look yeah. that up. I'm just curious. Does mm -hmm. anyone know? 1942, 43? <laughs> no, okay. Okay, Robert okay. Tyler. <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. That's right. It was R.T. Davis was the letter. So. Um, so I just think these kinds of stories in our history are so important and um, also is another way to illustrate the importance of our exhibition program and the impact it can make on our collecting. Uh, for instance, if you go to the next yes. slide, uh, after we had the exhibition Constructing Identity, I entertained three different collectors who came forward to say, I've noticed this shift in your programming and I want to uh, uh, donate in a couple of cases or step forward and, and uh, provide funding to purchase a work. Um, the John Outerbridge uh, work, John uh, Outerbridge is a significant longtime LA artist. Uh, this work was an important uh, part of his career uh, was given to his friend Robin Dunitz, who lives here in Portland, and she um, she came forward after that exhibition to make this donation. Um, Sonia Clark's penny loafers, you might remember in Constructing Identity, the Afro Abe $5 bill that um, Sonia had altered. Um, Barbara Christie Wagner fell in love with Sonia's work, and she wanted to buy that piece. I said, well, it's already, sorry, <laughs> it's in that collection. So we looked at some other pieces. Um, the penny loafers are on view now. And then um, Joseph Vaskovitz and Lisa Goodman are collectors that I know from my Seattle days who are significant collectors of African-American art and made a gift of three works to us just recently. Great additions. And then this very significant uh, piece by Carrie Mae Weems, which is um, we acquired in the... What's the number there? In 94. 94. My, mm -hmm. my glasses need to be improved. But um, this had a profound impact because you may recall we did the Carrie Mae Reams retrospective and also this major artist, Micheline Thomas, who's been here, who had a conversation, was a barista and a coffee um, server at one of the coffee shops, came to the Portland Art Museum, saw Carrie's pieces, inspired her to become a contemporary artist because she said, wait, maybe I can. I can see myself in a museum, another African-American woman, and therefore has launched her career and has become a, a real, a real significant artist working today, Micheline Thomas. And we wanted to show this image because... Well, I'm working to acquire this piece right now. Yes. Um, so, um, marshalling some funding to acquire this fantastic um, two-channel video work by Micheline um, that looks at the at um, African American women comedians and singers and their um, reflections on their own identity and their um, uh, existence in this world through through their art. And it's uh, very. There's a lot of humor and pathos and sadness within this piece. It's a wonderful um, collage-like uh, video installation. Um, I feel that this connection, uh, Carrie Mae Weems grew up here and is from Portland, and it's um, so important to, to recognize the artists who have that connection mm -hmm. to the community. Um, and we've acquired her work and had, had two exhibitions. Uh, and then with Micheline's continuing relationship with us, not only from her experience seeing Carrie's work here, but and coming and doing programs. And so this taking it to the next level to support an acquisition, I think is vital to um, growing our collection. I'm really excited about this and, and hopefully we'll get it soon, but it's very important to us and I think our history and, and what we're trying to do. Um, well done on identifying this work. And then more recently with the Contemporary Collectors Circle, which is a group that's another group that started that's providing great resources, we found this fantastic yet behind work that is now on display. Yeah, the Contemporary Collectors Circle is a great initiative for us because they uh, their mission is to supply funding to purchase uh, impactful works of art for the museum, uh, works that will uh, become those icons for generations to come when they visit. That And this work has already become uh, a 
well, it's a hit on Instagram, as you yes. can see, a photo credit is from Instagram, but uh, just a wonderful work that invites viewers in, um, invites a different kind of engagement with our spaces that um, is, I think, yeah, critical for today's visitors. Yeah, and you can see it at visitors. night, you can see it during the day, and again, the Instagram effect has been really impactful. We're trying <laughs> to get the artist to come, so Sarah and I keep working on that, so that could be a future program to have him come speak. He's, he's quite the art star these days. And then finally, uh, Sarah, uh, and Julia Dolan came to me about a year and a half ago, maybe, maybe two years two ago. Years ago. Mm -hmm. It's so important for us and our community to support our curators to curate and create new scholarship, new projects, new ideas. So when they came to me with the Hank Willis Thomas project, I knew right away, I said, that is a sounds like a really important project. And Sarah and Julia jumped, jumped on it. They're co-curating this. And to this day, we've got an, a major grant from the Warhol Foundation. We've got a major grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. We just were invited by the Luce Foundation, mm -hmm. which is extremely competitive to do this work. Some of you may have seen the recent announcement about the billboard initiatives across the country by artists. This is all being led by Hank Willis Thomas. This is an earlier piece that he did. And we're going to be doing the retrospective in two years or a year and a half? Uh, 2019, fall 2019. 2019. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yeah. talk a little bit about his work and then we'll conclude. Sure. Well, Hank is, uh, has been working for about 20 years. Um, he's a photo conceptual artist looking at um, issues of race in America and how um, visual culture uh, has continued to perpetuate stereotypes and uh, continues to support a kind of institutional, um, not a kind of, it supports institutional racism in our country and his work has been an, an attempt to get us to look more closely at those images and um, become better attuned to seeing when these, um, uh, when these um, stereotypes arise and, and picturing ourselves as uh, individuals who can work to dismantle these systems. Uh, his work ranges from photography, like you see here, uh, to sculpture, uh, to public art projects, like the billboard project you mentioned, which is part of his Four Freedoms initiative, an artist-run super PAC that um, is striving to inst instill and uh, bring artists and creative individuals into the political process and to make sure that um, that different voices are heard within our very crowded media landscape. He's a very sophisticated um, media consumer and media analyst, and um, so I'm just really excited about this work, and it's really struck a chord uh, with um, uh, receiving these wonderful uh, competitive grants, and um, so uh, we, he's has relationships with other institutions in, in Portland too, uh, PSU, uh, PNCA, uh, will also be um, collaborating with us um, as we develop this project. Wow. So stay tuned. It'll be a very, very important show for this museum. Sarah, congratulations on that. Congratulations to Julia. I wanted to thank many of you here tonight. You're, it's the Contemporary Art Council has been so important to this museum and we've tried to demonstrate. We're so grateful for your support. The trustees of this museum continue to support these initiatives to make this institution relevant and con completely evolving. I'm very grateful. And I'm so happy you're all here, and it's great to have the conversation. It's great to have you part of our team, Sarah. Thank you. And we're excited for the future and happy to take some questions. Sometimes there are, or maybe there's sometimes advice for us. We, we got advice <laughs> once. I think Mary and Beth and I got advice uh, on the, in the Asian collection. <laughs> and we take your advice very seriously. So questions or advice, we're welcome, uh, open to both. And we, oh, have a like we have a mic. Yep, we're going to pass it right here. Okay, so um, I... I've been here 22 years, but it really reminds me of Phil Knight. And I'm not really sure that has anything to do with Nike. But if you look what's above her right ear, I don't think that has anything to do with Nike. Is that correct? Uh, it has a little bit to do with Nike, but not like it, It's about how we become, we absorb these brands into our being, and okay. also how uh, sports, athletics in this country yes. is a, it's a huge multi billion, multi-billion dollar industry that's often on uh, the bodies of African Americans. Wow, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, my name is Ashley, 
And uh, I am Native American, and my best friend is from Mexico. And we started something called the Murder Sisters, which is uh, basically performance art. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is very, very much an impact for people who do not understand exactly what you go through mm -hmm. when you are part of a, a different race. Mm -hmm. So I, I am now looking for a place to perform. Well, okay. well that was yeah. great that you came. That's first, that's great and ask that question. And yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate your perspective and maybe we can talk after the, after the we're all wrapped up here. So thank you, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Um, I marvel at your courage in being able to anticipate that a, a young artist can move forward and make a contribution and so on. Have you had the experience where you look back 10 years or 20 years and said, my God, I was out of my mind to support that person. <laughs> like, I, I made a mistake? <laughs> I made a mistake, yes. Yeah, yeah sure. Sure. Um, I'll let you answer that one, yeah. though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess what, what excites me about contemporary art is that it, it really is often, it's not known what's what it will become. And the way that I've worked as a curator has often been to support artists who are taking a chance or are want to try something new. And sometimes there are failures in that. And I think that that's okay. You know, if they continue to work as an artist, they'll learn from that. Or even if they don't, you know, I think we put something out into the world that is an expression of our culture and, it, and is, um, and is of value at that moment. So, um, but I think that's what, you know, that's why I get up and do what I do is that I am always, I'm always learning and I'm always learning with artists and my colleagues and the staff here at the museum. And, um, you know, it, it, Increasingly today in our environment, it feels like all that we do in this creative realm is a risk. And um, so I'm really happy to be here in this institution where we are kind of still nurturing and are, are willing to take those chances. Yeah. And I'm hopeful. I mean, we're stewards at this moment, and I'm hopeful that 125 years from now, they'll look back and maybe say, wow, they did the Hank Willis Thomas project in 2019. That's the goal. And uh, so it's really exciting to, to think about that. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you.